This lesson is for section 7.4. We're going to be splitting this up into two different parts. In this first part of the lesson, we're actually going to focus on some very basic Algebra 1 um, and Algebra 2 skills in relation to trig expressions. So our goal for today is to be able to simplify and factor trig expressions, um, and then to also use some basic trig identities, which we'll talk about in a second, to calculate trig functions. Then in part two of our lesson, we're actually going to be using the skills that we're working on today to prove different trig uh, identities. So this is going to be a foundation for uh, some more difficult problems from this section. So I want to begin by talking about the notation that you're going to see throughout the next few chapters. Now when you see sine of theta, um, instead of using parentheses like we have been doing in the past, we're actually going to drop the parentheses and just write that as sine theta, except when we have a sum or a difference. Or if we have, let's say, a negative value in front of theta, we would use parentheses then. Um, something like 2 times the sine of theta times the cosine of theta, same thing goes here. We're just going to drop the parentheses and write that as 2 sine theta cosine theta. Um, whenever you have a power that you're raising sine or cosine or anything to, um, instead of writing it with the entire expression being squared, we actually write it commonly like this. So this is read as sine squared theta. So that could be if it was cubed or to the fourth power, we would write that as uh, sine cubed theta instead. Um, except in the case where we have this particular exponent here. This would actually be read as the inverse of sine. Okay, so when it's to the uh, negative first power, then we simply write it like that. That's the only case where we don't write it. This would not be how we would write that, okay? Now over to the right here, I have some very important identities that we're going to be using throughout our trig uh, unit and into calculus as well. So these are really important ones that you're going to use, and we're already familiar with these bottom three here, right? These are just the definitions of secant, cosecant, and cotangent, the reciprocal functions of cosine, sine, and tangent. Um, but this is also really important. Um, knowing that tangent theta is sine theta over cosine theta, you're going to use this a lot and break down tangent and write that as the ratio of sine over cosine. Um, likewise, this is a very common identity that you're going to be using and find useful. And that's sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. Now this is actually going to come from the fact that we're using a unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's the equation of a unit circle. And we know that by definition, we say that x is equal to the cosine of theta, and y is equal to the sine of theta. Now if I simply substitute here this x for cosine theta, I end up with cosine squared theta, right? That's the common notation that we use plus sine of theta squared, and again, I would use the common notation here and write that as sine squared theta equal to 1. So I'm really just using substitution here. Now I do talk about that in our proof notes, so you're going to see this a little bit more explicitly in our proof notes, but these are very, very important um, identities that you're going to use uh, both in today's lesson and tomorrow. The first example here is actually a pretty easy uh, algebra problem here. It just says asks us to simplify. Now this might look really complex, but if you look at cosine cubed theta, sine squared theta, and over here we have cosine cubed theta and sine squared theta. That's simply like seeing the same problem written like that. Well I have actually like terms here. You can almost con consider these like terms. So if I simplify this I'd have negative 5 c cubed s squared which then I could rewrite as negative 5 cosine cubed theta sine squared theta. And that would be how I would simplify this expression. Okay, now in problem 2, they're asking us to factor this expression. Now this is read as 3 times the cotangent squared of beta. Right? This is just another Greek le um, letter here. And really, this is not something that you're going to see typically in, in your trig uh, problems. We won't just ask you, hey, factor this expression. Um, it w instead, it's going to be actually embedded within a problem where you're going to have to recognize this as something that is factorable, and then by factoring it, you will be able to um, cancel out factors and simplify a problem even further. So this is just a mini skill that's part of one of the skills that you're going to work on in your lesson tomorrow. So just to talk about factoring this, remember, you can always let some va variable, let's call it uh, t, let's let t equal the cotangent of beta. Okay, now I can use that. It's really powerful because now I can um, just use substitution here and say that this expression here is equivalent to 3 times t squared plus t minus 2. And now all I have to do is factor this expression. So that's just uh, the product of 3t minus 2 and t plus 1, I believe. 
Let's see if that works. Yes, it does. Okay, so now that I have it factored, I'm simply going to substitute cotangent of beta back in. So this is 3 times the cotangent of beta minus 2 times the cotangent of beta plus 1. So this is our factored expression for problem 2. So the directions in 3 and 4 are the exact same as problem number 1, but here there's a lot more strategy involved in simplifying these trig expressions. Now one of those strategies that you're going to use every time you see um, a trig expression or a trig identity that you're trying to prove um, will be to rewrite all of your trig functions in terms of either sine or cosine. So for example, when I see the cosecant of a, I'm going to change that using our, our rules, right? Above we have our definitions and our identities that we're going to be using. Um, the cosecant of a is the same as 1 over sine of a. So 1 over sine of a plus 1. So I'm rewriting cosecant of a in terms of sine of a. Now the cosine of a is already written in terms of cosine, so we'll keep it that way. But cotangent of a is the reciprocal function of tangent. So I'm going to take the reciprocal of tangent, and that would give me, whoops, cosine over sine. At this point, I'm actually going to use a new strategy here. So another strategy when you're simplifying trig expressions is to rewrite using a common denominator. So sometimes you want to have a common denominator, other times you're going to split up a fraction, but in this case I want to share a common denominator here. So in the numerator of this overall expression here, uh, that common denominator would be sine of a. So I'm going to rewrite this as 1 plus sine of a over sine of a. And in the denominator, uh, the uh, common denominator of this fraction would be sine of a. So this would be cosine a times sine of a plus cosine a all over the sine of a. So I'm just rewriting both the top and the bottom here. Um, in terms of a common denominator. This may look like a mess, but really what, the, what we have here, we just have a fraction divided by another fraction, right? So let's say I had 2 thirds divided by 4 thirds. If I wanted to divide these fractions, I can say that this is the same as multiplying by this reciprocal, right? And that makes it a pretty dip, or easy problem from here on out. I'm going to do the same thing mathematically that I just did there with those fractions, but instead I have these trig expressions. So I'm going to take 1 plus the sine of a over the sine of a, so the numerator of our overall uh, fraction here, and I'm going to multiply it by the reciprocal of this guy. So I have sine of a on top over cosine a sine a plus cosine a. Okay, now these will cancel, and I'm left with 1 plus the sine of a over the cosine of a sine of a plus the cosine of a. Now, here's where you're going to be able to recognize, or you should be able to recognize the fact that in the denominator, I can actually factor out a cosine. So, let me keep that numerator the same. In the denominator, if I take out the cosine of a, I'm left with the sine of a plus 1. Okay. Now, again, these factors will cancel, and I'm left with 1 over the cosine of a. Now, this could be your simplified final answer here, or you could rewrite this, um, if you didn't want to have a fraction here, as the secant of a. So, this entire expression that we started with, let's shrink this down a little bit, is equivalent to 1 over cosine of a, or secant of a. Now, for you guys to get practice, I'd like you to try number 4 on your own, and check that one with the key. It's very similar to what we just worked on in problem 3. I actually just played back problem three here uh, just to see you know how it sounded and I realized that when I canceled out this factor I wasn't really explicit about why um, this this cancels it looks like I just struck you know canceled sine of a with this whole entire factor here but I hope you're realizing that one plus sine of a has to um, go together so if I for example had the sine of a over the sine of a plus one these don't cancel, leaving me with just 1 over 1, right? I have to have the exact same um, you know, factor in both the numerator and the denominator. So it's this entire expression here that should have been striked through, canceled, here, leaving you with, in the numerator, you have to have something in there, like that numerator on top really is the value of 1. So 1 over the cosine of a. Okay, so that's uh, just to be a little bit more thorough about that question.
Now problem five is similar to some questions that we've already completed in previous sections here in chapter seven, but you'll also see it in this section as well. So I just want to review this real quick with you. Um, here it says if the cosine of theta is equal to negative three fifths and theta is in between pi and three halves pi, uh, let's evaluate all six trig functions. Well, what we're going to do in this problem um, is start with the fact that I, I have an identity. I know that the cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. Previously, what we were using was x squared plus y squared is equal to one, right? We were given an, an x coordinate here. Well, this is almost the exact same, but because they're giving us in terms of cosine theta, I'm going to use that new identity that we talked about. And cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. So I'm going to substitute in the cosine of theta. So negative three fifths squared plus sine squared theta. And in this case, um, I, you can call it y if you wanted to, but you don't have to either here. Um, and then you're going to evaluate and solve for uh, sine. So we have 9 25ths plus, just for convenience sake, I'm going to change that into a y. y squared equals 1. And if I solve here for that y value, I have 16 25ths, right? I'm going to take the square root, and I do end up with two possible uh, solutions here, positive or negative 4 fifths. Now, this is saying that the sine of theta is equal to either positive or negative four fifths. If you look at the original um, directions here, it says that theta lies between pi and three halves pi. So if it lies between pi and three halves pi, okay, that means it's somewhere in the third quadrant, right? So theta here lies somewhere within the third quadrant. Now, it, because it's lying in the third quadrant, I don't want to have a positive value for my sign. Uh, this will always have a negative value for that sign. So we're going to use sine theta or y equals negative four fifths. And then after that, I think it should be very simple for you guys to um, go ahead and evaluate all six trig functions. We've already found two of them, right? We already know what cosine theta and sine theta are equal to. But go ahead and do the rest, um, and uh, you can go on to the next problem after that. Check with the key. Okay, now to finish off the lesson, I have two more examples here of trig expressions that we're trying to simplify. Now, the idea here is to show you that no two trig problems are ever going to be the exact same. Um, and there's quite a lot of strategy involved in doing these. Sometimes you're going to go and, and drive yourself crazy because you, you're feeling like you can't get anywhere. Like, for example, if we only use our strategy of uh, writing in terms of sine or cosine, we'd, we'd get stuck here on problem six because everything is already in terms of sine, right? So... In this case, we need a new strategy. Now, we can try to find a common denominator here. And when I do that, so I'd have to multiply right on the left-hand fraction here by 1 plus sine theta over 1 plus sine theta. Really, I'm just multiplying by 1. It's really important that you guys always multiply by 1. A lot of times, algebraically, students will make the mistake of, for example, on this one, just multiplying by 1 uh, minus sine theta on the top instead of on both. So just be really careful that you're being consistent. But on the left-hand side, if I multiply this fraction here, let me write it out, um, I actually create something called a difference of squares. Now, that's another strategy that you guys can use. Okay, so create your own difference of squares. So difference of squares, that just means something like x squared minus 4. Difference, because we have subtraction. This is a term squared. This is a term squared. So that's the vocabulary term that I'm using here, difference of squares. But basically, when I multiply that left side fraction, I end up with, in the numerator, 1 plus sine theta. And in the denominator, I'd have to FOIL this, right? Normally, I'd FOIL this. But I know that this follows the pattern of just being the first term squared minus my second term squared. So I'd write this now as 1 minus sine squared theta, OK? So again, I could FOIL that out, but it would take me a little bit longer to do. Um, that's why I want to recognize the fact that this would create a difference of squares and then use the fact that, let's say I had x squared minus 4, this would factor into x plus 2 times x minus 2. I know that if I multiply these together, I should get right back to here. OK, that's that's all I'm doing. I'm using that little shortcut. Now, the right-hand side fraction also needs to be multiplied. And this time, I'd multiply by 1 minus sine theta. So I'm going to do that in both the numerator and the denominator. So I now have one giant fraction here. OK, so I'm going to just add this numerator here on top. Well, this just gives me. 1 minus sine theta. OK, now from here, I'm going to simplify. So I've got 2 um, in the numerator, because sine theta minus sine theta will cancel. So I have 2 over 1 minus sine squared theta. 
Now at this point, um, some students will stop here because they don't recognize this as something that they can rewrite. Now remember our, our Pythagorean identity that we talked about at the very beginning of the lesson here was that the cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. Well, you need to be able to recognize when this has been manipulated. So if I were to subtract sine squared theta to the other side, I have an alternate form of this identity, one minus sine squared theta. So now I'm gonna use the fact that one minus sine squared theta can be substituted as cosine squared theta, and I'm gonna rewrite this as two over cosine squared theta. So this is now as simplified as that could get. However, if I wanted to write that without a fraction, I could always use my reciprocal function here and write that as two times secant squared theta, okay? So again, these problems, they're not easy. I'm not gonna lie to you, they're not easy. You might make a ton of mistakes um, and you might get really frustrated with it, but you just gotta keep working at it and you're, you're gonna develop a lot of algebra skills as you progress through them. So I'm gonna do um, one more with you guys. Um, or actually, I might leave you hanging on this problem. I'll do part of it with you and then let you guys finish it off. Um, so our first strategy that we talked about was rewriting in terms of sine and cosine. So I see that the first fraction here is already written in terms of sine and cosine, so I'm going to leave it just like that. The second fraction, though, is 1 over the tangent of t, which is really the cotangent of t. Um, but I'm just going to take the reciprocal of tangent, and I know I can write that then as cos cosine of t over sine of t. And after that, um, because I have two fractions, I'm going to try to combine these. I'm going to see where that takes me. So I want to ha have a common denominator here. Now the common denominator between these would be sine, sine t times cosine t. So the only thing I really have to do here is multiply by cosine t over cosine t. Okay, so now I'm left with 1 minus, in the numerator, cosine squared t all over sine t cosine t. I kind of said that weird all over. So all over cosine t sine t. Now from here I would like you guys to try to simplify. This is going to be really similar hint hint to something that we did right over here. Okay so go ahead simplify that check with the key see how you do um, and then tomorrow you're going to get a ton of practice with simplifying these trig expressions. Remember this is a really important skill that's going to follow you basically through calculus one two three and beyond. Okay. All right, uh, that's the end of the lesson. I'll see you tomorrow.